All right, well, good evening and welcome everyone to the American Cetacean Society, San Francisco Bay Chapters, August 2024 speaker event. And I'm Susan Hopp, board member responsible for our speaker program. And with me is fellow board member, Wade Cobb. And first for anyone new to the American Cetacean Society, we are a chapter within a national organization that is the oldest nonprofit dedicated to the protection of whales, dolphins, porpoises, and their habitat. And we do this through education, community engagement, and awarding grants towards cetacean research. And we so appreciate your donations in support of our mission. The donations fund our research grants um, and expenses for these talks. It's easy to donate on our website um, if you haven't at time of registration. So th thank you again. Now, we also have an important announcement. Um, that is, we are really excited to resume our education program with our new online class, the Gulf of the Greater Farallons and its inhabitants. Now, it's, it will meet over six Wednesday evenings and it begins on September 11th. So please go to our website to learn more and sign up. And did I say that it begins on September 11th and goes for six Wednesday evenings? All right, so we are recording this session and please put your questions in the Q&A. That's better than the chat. And after the presentation, we'll do our best uh, to get to the questions. So tonight's talk is Moving Cargo, Keeping Whales, Identifying Solutions for Ocean Noise Pollution. So, you know, we hear a lot and have covered in our talks the impact of shipping as a cause of marine mammal mortality events, which is harmful enough. But what about commercial shipping's contribution to ocean noise and its impact on the lives of animals that rely on sound for daily life functions? That is our focus tonight, and we're really grateful to have as our speaker, Dr. Vanessa Zobel. Uh, she is a postdoctoral researcher at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. Specializing in acoustical oceanography, Dr. Zobel utilizes innovative techniques to explore areas of the ocean with high human use. Her primary objective is to leverage data-driven insights and advanced modeling to develop effective solutions for mitigating threats to marine organisms in rapidly changing marine environments. Dr. Zobel's current research focuses on pioneering noise pollution reduction strategies for commercial vessels, encompassing measures such as speed adjustments, enhanced design considerations, optimized routes, and strategic scheduling. Her research, her research contributes to the development of the blue economy and sustainable marine transportation, informing both research as well as international policy. Uh, Vanessa, we're, we're very glad for your work and we really appreciate you being with us. And with that, I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Susan. And thanks everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen, my share my sound, share, and here we go. Let's see. Okay. So hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Like Susan said, I'm a postdoc um, here in San Diego uh, in the Scripps Machine Listening Lab, and we study sound in the ocean. So I'm going to go first over... Um, why we would do that, how we do that, and why it's important to study sound. Then I'm going to go over some of the incredible sounds that animals make. And then I'll be talking about some of the solutions that we're investigating to reduce noise pollution in the ocean. So 90% of the ocean looks like this, pitch black. Absolutely, you cannot see anything. Um, light penetrates only about the top 100 to 200 meters of the ocean. So once you get past that, you need to use different senses to perceive the world around you. So 
animals have evolved to use sound as one of their primary senses to go about the world because it is more efficient than light in the ocean. And um, they can use sound to communicate over really long distances um, to avoid predators, to forage, to find their food, whether that's through echolocating or communicating during foraging bouts and to navigate. Um, so when you're in the deep sea, everything is pitch black. Animals can echolocate so they know where the ground is, where a canyon is, um, or where a school of fishes or squid is that they want to go and forage. Um, so sound is super important for marine mammals, what we're here for today, but many other marine organisms too, like fish and invertebrates. Sound is also about four times faster, travels four times faster in seawater than it is, than it travels in air. So it travels about 1500 meters per second in seawater, which is about 15 um, football fields. Um, when in, in an air, it only travels about 340 meters. So on land, we use sight as one of our main senses to perceive the world, but underwater, um, because seawater is so good at um, transporting sound, that is another reason why they've capitalized on the sense of sound. So we measure sound in a couple different ways. The first way that I'll talk about is frequency, which you can kind of think of as the pitch. So high frequency is high pitch, um, like a flute, and low frequency is low pitch more like an oboe, I think. <laughs> but um, frequency, we can measure that in our data. So if something with a high frequency sound, which I'll play for you in a little bit, um, like a whistle or an echolocation click, we can know that those animals are in the area. And when we hear more of a low frequency sound, like a low groan, um, only certain um, animals make those low frequency sounds. So Frequency is one way we measure sound. And another way is intensity or the loudness or the amplitude of the sound. And we measure that in decibels. So this is in measuring the intensity is different in sound than it is in seawater. So this isn't exactly to scale, but um, here's, here are some examples. Fireworks are about 140 decibels. Um, a, a conversation that you might have is about 60 decibels and a whisper is about 30 decibels. So it can really range in loudness or intensity and um, different animals make different intensity sounds. And then of course, if you're farther away from a, an animal, it might sound quieter than if you're right up close to one. So intensity is another way that we measure sound. And there's so many different species in the ocean creating different sounds. Um, their anatomy is different and therefore different sounds that are created by these animals can sound much different. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned before, sound is used for predator prey interactions, for growth and reproduction, for communication, for navigation and foraging. And I believe next we're gonna listen to some sounds. So here we have killer whale, Orsinus orca. This is a toothed whale, an odontocete. An odontocete is dent, uh, Latin for tooth. So these are the toothed animals. And the toothed animals create higher frequency sounds like whistles, echolocation clicks, and buzzes. Um, and killer whales can make all of these sounds. Some toothed whales can only make um, certain sounds, but killer whales can make all of these sounds and they can create some of the most complex sounds um, in the toothed whales. And they're the largest dolphin of the dolphin family. So they're named killer whales, but they are actually dolphins. Um, and here's what they sound like. So 
So that was really loud in my AirPods. So hopefully that sounded okay for you guys. Um, but sounded good. yeah, sounded good. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so yeah, killer whales, they sound kind of like squeaky dolphins, like this, the, uh, a squeaky toy, but they're the top predators of the ocean. And they use these sounds to help them forage um, on fish. Uh, and the fish eaters can echolocate and make sound as they're foraging because the fish cannot perceive their sounds. But mammal eating um, killer whales will be more stealth with their communication because what they're feeding on can hear them. But once they get that kill, they are celebrating, they are whistling, clicking, making some really big tonal calls as kind of like a social behavior after they get um, a kill, which is super, definitely something the top predator of the ocean would do. So that is the killer whale. Um, next we have short beat common dolphin, Delphinus delphus. These are super abundant off the coast of California. They can be in very large pods, hundreds and to even thousands called super pods. They're also very fast. Um, they have this like hourglass coloring with gray and white and tan. And um, their babies can be super small, basically like the size of a football but it's um it's very cute to see so here is a short beak common dolphin you can kind of hear how they're high frequency like the killer whale but a little bit different too so lots of clicking in there that's how they um, echolocate, they, they're shooting sound out of their melon, their, which is vibrated in the nasal passage, actually, and then it's being propagated out through um, some fat storage in the melon. And you also hear some whistles in there. And these sounds are created in the phonic lips of the nasal passage. So if you can imagine like slowly letting air out of a balloon, that's kind of the same mechanism that these animals are using to make these sounds. Um, yeah, short beak common dolphin. So sperm whale, bisetter macrocephalus. So if in, you can write in the chat, does anyone know what macro means in Latin, big or small? Do you think it's big or small? I'll give it like 10 seconds. If I, oh, there you go, Miko. Very good. So macro, large, cephalus, head, large head. These animals have very large heads. Their head is about one third of their body. So <laughs> they have a very large oil. Um, it, the, it's actually called spermaceti um, that has a very, a lot of oil. And that's why a lot of people hunted them. Um, and they they allowed us to have light for a long time with our oil lights. But um, so these animals create an echolocation click that is propagated out through that head. It actually bounces back to the back of the skull and then propagates out another head. So it's echoing inside their head. And um, some researchers in our lab, Natalie Palstalgian, can actually get um, the distance or the size of their head by calculating the time between the echoes. And if we know the size of their head, we can get an estimate of the size of the animal because we know that the head is about a third of the body. So just by listening, we can get so much information, like even the size of an animal in some cases, like these sperm whales. So super interesting topic of research there. And this is what they sound like. So it kind of sounds like, and you can write in the chat if it reminds you of something too um, throughout this whole presentation. But to me, it kind of sounds like tapping on a tin can. Um, very different than the dolphins, right? 
So these animals don't really create whistles, but they have the time between their clicks captures or encodes people think a lot of information. Um, and that's not only they can echolocate to forage and navigate, but they also produce these codas um, that they can vary the timing between their clicks, which people think um, has a lot of information in it and how they can communicate. So sperm whales. Um, and oops. okay, so now moving on to baleen whales. Um, so sperm whales are toothed whales. Uh, the animals that we've seen so far have all been toothed whales, but we're moving into baleen whales now, mysticetes. Mysticetes, <laughs> that's actually mustache. These are the mustached animals, and they call them that because baleen, which you see in the top or right, top right corner, is kind of like the same material as our nails, and they use baleen to take big gulps of water, um, and then they'll push the water out with their tongue and retain all the little krill or small bait fish that remains and then gulp that down. So humpback whales are for our first example here, Megoptera novangelii. And these are also called the winged whale because they have really long pectoral, um, pectoral fins, which helps them kind of navigate in the ocean. And um, it's not just this one that has these kind of knobs or scallops on the pectoral fin. They all have that. And that helps with um, hydrodynamics, cutting through the water and um, navigating and really being really majestic in the water. So mysticetes, which you'll hear soon, they make lower frequency sounds like moans, songs, grumbles. <laughs> um, and I will play one for you now. So humpback whale that is that has a multi um, multi platinum record. You can get the record if you would like. I think it's super relaxing. Like I go to bed to this, but I know some people think it's really scary. But so right, you can write in the chat. Feel free if if how it makes you feel as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, humpback whale. They have mo they can make these songs for hours and hours and hours and only males make this song females can make sound um used in foraging but only males um produce sing the song and interestingly there there's kind of like a cultural um trans transfer of learning of the song so all humpbacks in the pacific sing the same song um literally they sing it in different um slightly different ways and like they might sing it for an hour and then stop or another animal might sing it for multiple hours depending on what that animal is doing um if it's in if it's next to a male they might be singing next to each other as competition and that's what um it's usually done in the breeding season so people think it's either male male competition um or attracting a female but i think um, it's mostly male male competition and the the most fit males can sing this song in a way where they if there's a gap in the song that's when they'll go up for a breath so it kind of almost sounds like an animal's never breathing which if you never have to take a breath you must be a very strong mate so that's kind of how um uh they have they promote dominance in that way but yeah so if a if a male that is very dominant starts to sing the song in a slightly different way then the whole population will start singing it in that way too so it's kind of that cultural transfer of of knowledge so humpback whales are very cool oh <laughs> so minky whales um are the smallest baleen whale they have that white spot on that pectoral fin which some people call minky mittens. Um, they are also create low frequency sounds, but 
much different than the humpback song so take a listen Oh, I'm glad to see that the dogs are loving it. Yeah, I have heard, I have played some sounds before and people have said that they're dogs. Yes, definitely like a foghorn. It sounds like a foghorn to me too. So very, not, not as sing-songy and long duration. Duration is another way that we measure sounds. So we can measure, you can imagine the duration of a click is milliseconds while the duration of some of these sounds can be 10 seconds um, or and then sometimes multiple sounds all together they'll be making it over and over again um, we'll even just call it about so if they're if they're making these foghorn sounds for 20 minutes then we'll call that about of minky whale um, calls so that is minky whale and our last baleen whale, the fin whale, second largest animal on earth, right after the blue whale, um, close cousins to the blue whale. They, they're very, they're just slightly smaller. They have a white, um, a white patch of skin on the jaw and their uh, dorsal fin is a little bit more curved than blue whales, but sometimes it can be really hard to tell what is a blue whale and what is a fin whale um, if you're not super close up. Um, but yeah, there are many fin whales off the coast of California. And these are one of the animals that get hit by ships a lot. I'm, there's blue whales do too. And I'm, we have no clue how many whales get hit because so many just sink to the bottom and they're never brought and they don't ever come to shore, but um, a lot of fin whales, a couple of fin whales in San Diego um, have gotten hit by ships and have, they didn't even know, the ship didn't even know that they hit it because the ship was so big. Um, so they just came in with two fin whales on the bow and um, they had no clue. And then we had another fin whale get hit um, this year too by a ship. But fin whales, are my favorite whale. And I will play you their song now. And this is actually sped up five times because otherwise it's pretty low. It's so low frequency that humans have trouble hearing it. So kind of sounds like a heartbeat to me, but let me know what you guys think too. Um, so, oh, so of course, oh wait, let's see what, oh, heart. I know, it's, I love that song and yeah, that's my favorite one. Um, so many different animals in the ocean and I played you some toothed whales, toothed whale sounds, some baleen whale sounds, um, but there's so many other animals, snapping shrimp, um, fish chorusing, lobsters can make sounds by scraping their appendages together. So there's so much beautiful biophony or biologically created sounds in the ocean. Um, but um, we humans also use the ocean as a resource through many different things we um, drill for oil off of the coast. We have some actively drilling oil rigs off the coast of California still, and there's over 3,000 actively drilling oil rigs off the in the Gulf of Mexico. So um, we also have Navy operations and Navy testing, and then commercial shipping as well, which is how we get all of the shoes that we're wearing today, if you're wearing shoes, our cell phones, our laptops. So um, we use the ocean as a resource and with that inject some noise into the ocean as well. And I, 
I switched to the term noise instead of sound. Um, sound is, or you can kind of think of those two words um, differently, a noise being the a sound that is considered a disturbance. So in this context, we study animals that make sounds and noise or noise pollution is their disturbance. Um, but so I just wanted to clarify why I'm switching between those two, those two terms, but yes. So um, there's a couple different impacts that animals uh, that that noise impacts of noise on animals like communication masking which is when the the noise of a human generated source like shipping is so loud that the animals can't hear each other um, it masks their communication it would kind of be like trying to have a conversation on a airport tarmac um, which would be harder than having a conversation in your kitchen with someone. So that would be an example of communication masking. There's also physiological impacts like um, increases in stress hormone levels. And there haven't been I'm, that many instances in modern history where there has been a region that went from heavily trafficked to no traffic. Um, 9-11 was one instance on the U.S. East Coast, and researchers that were getting blubber samples from North Atlantic right whales um, compared the before and after of 9-11 when shipping stopped on the U.S. East Coast, and they found that cortisol levels or stress hormone levels significantly decreased when shipping stopped. So physiological impacts like um, increases in stress hormones are also found. And then behavioral changes, animals might leave an area because they do not wanna be in the, in the noise. And then some animals do not leave. They would rather get, if, if their preferred food source and preferred prey is in an area, some animals will not leave because there is noise. Um, these animals evolved way before shipping was um, brought about in their lives. So they don't have, um, or some, some species don't really have the mechanisms to uh, get out of a certain situation. And there's not a lot of opportunity to learn because once you are hit by a ship, you can't really try again, um, unfortunately. So behavioral changes, some will come up to the surface more to get their head in air um, or to get it in a more attenuated area because um, seawater transfers sound so so far and fast that these animals want to get their ears and air instead, or their hearing structures and um, air rather. Um, they can also have damage to hearing structures, especially with mid-frequency active sonar. Um, there have been um, there have been instances where the actual hearing structures will be deformed or damaged from a sound that is um, so intense. But animals have to be pretty close to the sound source or the sound source has to be pretty loud for that to happen. And that's not that's not only for mammals, but fish and invertebrates as well, like squid. So um, there's been hundreds and hundreds of papers, academic research papers on this subject documenting these impacts of noise on animals um, via communication masking, physiological impacts, behavior, and more for mammals. Many different um, species of marine mammals, some more than others. Dolphins are really heavily studied just because people have them and train them um, in, in um, captive situations to be able to have them um, exposed to different sound sources and then study them super closely. It's harder for the larger animals. Obviously we can't have a blue whale being trained to tell us when it hears a certain signal. It would be cool though, I'm, but um, some animals are, you have to model it or if you have a CT scan of the skull, you can kind of model what sounds that they hear in that way. Um, but yeah, there's, and then fish, fish and invertebrates as well have many, many papers about um, these impacts. So um, 
so just a little bit more about shipping and then we're going to get into the solutions because I um, enjoy studying that part. So, um, and there are so many solutions as you will see very soon. Um, but shipping, these are uh, container vessels uh, around the US and Mexico and South America. There are a lot of them. Some are, some areas are more lit up here. You y'all up in San Francisco, us down here in Southern California, Gulf of Mexico is pretty lit up. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of container ships in the water and we have only been really listening to the ocean since around late 1950s, early 1960s. And there were already hundreds of thousands of ships on the water at that time. So we don't really know what the ocean sound like in many of these trafficked areas. Um, before ships, we don't we don't know what they sounded like in pre-industrial times. So I'm just going to play you a quick example of what a container ship off of the port of Los Angeles sounds like, busiest shipping port in the Western Hemisphere. not as pretty as the humpback whale, that is for sure. Um, there are about 15 transits just, just on the traffic separation scheme, many more beyond that of container ships. So hearing this day after day and month after month, um, it's, it's um, created higher than natural noise levels in that area. So, um, I'll just, I'll go down to my area of study for a little bit, and then I'll speak more about Northern California as well. But here we have, um, right off the coast of Santa Barbara um, and LA, we have the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And it's an area that's super biodiverse. You have kelp forests, you have marine mammals, and um, like seals and sea lions and also whales and dolphins all around this area. It's a super productive and biodiverse area because you have the islands, a lot of upwelling and a lot of um, nutrients here. Um, there's also two biologically important feeding areas for the blue whale and the humpback whale. Um, they come, blue whales come up here to forage during the summer um, and humpback whales are here in the spring and fall too. And some humpback whales are seen year round here, um, but it's a super important feeding area for blue whales. And both of these animals are considered endangered under the, under the Endangered Species Act. And of course, protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act as well. So cutting through and intersecting all of these boundaries are the shipping lanes that um, support cargo ship and a couple, not as many, but there's also tankers here, but mostly cargo ships that transport to and from the port of Los Angeles and the port of Long Beach, um, the first and second busiest shipping ports in the Western hemisphere in the US. So loads of traffic here, a really um, complex human wildlife interaction because of course we use a lot of things that come on ships, about 80 to 90% of our goods were once on a ship. So um, how can we create a system where um, we can have a sustainable transportation model that allows for these animals to be in the regions that they need to forage in during the times that they need to forage in? Um, and that's kind of what we'll talk about for the rest of the time. Um, so my, I created a, a couple of different noise models because we wanted to see what the sound was like in this area. Um, so here I have a pre-industrial ocean noise model. As I mentioned, we, ha we haven't been studying this area. We've been studying it. Um, we've had these two high frequency acoustic recording packages here for about 15 years, but of course shipping was well underway before then. So, um, so we wanted to kind of model what the ocean would sound like without any ships. And so we use geophysical sounds like wind to and a ocean and a wind noise model to look at what the ocean would sound like with no ships and only wind sounds. And um, we have these are our recording devices, kind of what they look like 
um, right here. And we have one, this big star right off of point, point conception, and then one right smack dab in the middle of the shipping lane, um, a little bit in the basin. And so then we modeled what the ocean sounds like in modern day. So here, all these little black lines are ship tracks. The uh, head of the ship is pointed in the direction that it's going. Um, and this is hourly sound level in the ocean. So you can see it's a lot uh, redder and the color scale is the intensity of the sound. So blue is quieter sounds and red is um, more uh, louder sounds or more, more intense sounds. So these ships are creating much higher than natural noise levels in this area. And they're propagating much farther than their track lines. As we learned in the beginning of the talk, it can sound can travel far and fast. So um, especially when there's a lot of ships all next to each other, it kind of sums together and creates even, even higher noise levels. So, um, so what are we gonna do? We have these ships, we, we need to trade and we need to transport goods, but we definitely would like it to be quieter. So we're gonna talk about solutions now. Yay, my favorite topic. Um, and the first, the first program that we talked to about this issue was the Protecting Blue Whales and Blue Skies program. Um, this program is completely voluntary. It started in Southern California, but now it is also in Northern California. It's all across the whole California coast, which is very exciting. And this program um, incentivizes uh, large ships, 300 gross tons or more, to reduce their speeds to a target speed of 10 knots or less in the, um, in the speed reduction zone. So at the beginning of the program, you could imagine shipping companies are like, what? Time is money. We got to get to the port. We got to get this stuff off. And then we got to go back and get more. So um, the program started by giving a small financial reward, about a couple thousand to a couple tens of thousands of dollars, and then positive public recognition um, articles and newspapers, articles and magazines, and a, and a trophy with a whale tail that the companies really liked. And so every year they've gotten more and more companies to be um, in this program. And then now I believe they don't give the financial rewards anymore, but they, the shipping companies are make our billion dollar industry. So um, this was really not necessary for the shipping companies um, and so they, there's been more and more participation on the U.S. West Coast, off the coast of California. Um, and there are no regulations at this time in this area. There's another NOAA voluntary speed reduction program. And there's a speed reduction program off of Port of L.A. and Long Beach. Um, but yeah, it's kind of amazing what you can do with positive public recognition. So the number of companies started at about five um, or a little over five in 2014. And now it's grown to um, over 20 and hundreds of vessels that are in the, in the program at this time. So it's grown a lot, which is awesome. So we use, it's grown. <laughs> so we have our acoustic recording package right smack dab in the, shipping lane and we looked at all the participating vessels that went through that went across our acoustic recording device and we found that the speed or the the reduced speed of the vessels drastically decreased the ship noise um, that the vessels produced so here you have speed on the x-axis here and ship noise on the y-axis and you have an increasing trend. So as speed increases, ship noise increases as well. And the vessels that participated and reduced their speeds to 10 knots had a much lower um, source level, as we call it, than the, than the vessels that were zipping down going 20 knots. So it's a really great program that not only reduces ship noise, but also reduces air pollution emissions 
um, which is really important to reduce those in port cities and for climate change in general. And it also reduces the risk of ship strikes. So you get a three, a three benefits all from just slowing down vessel speed. So vessels, oh, and we wrote a paper about this a couple of years ago, if you wanna give it a read. So speed reduction is, it's, it's not globally um, incentivized yet. Uh, and you can, it's really good for protecting certain regions that um, are critical habitats to marine mammals like blue whales. You really want to target those areas for noise reduction as best as you can. But ships are, shipping is an international industry that goes across countries, across states, across cities. And so it's also important to think about a more international approach to reduce noise. And um, this is being talked about in many different programs. International Maritime Organization is working hard to figure out ways to reduce underwater radiative noise of vessels in the International Whaling Commission as well. So to try to figure out how to reduce noise on a more international level, um, we, Scripps and our lab partnered with one of the largest shipping companies in the world, Maersk. It's a Danish shipping line. Um, I believe is the second largest now, but it was the first, it was, it's an enormous shipping line. And they took it upon themselves to do a redesign of some of their vessels. So, or a retrofit. So they, they, and this was for fuel efficiency. This wasn't um, to reduce underwater rated noise, but we wanted to see if it did as a co-benefit. So they changed the propellers, they modified the bow, they um, and they they elevated the navigation bridge so they could stack more containers on top. So what we found, oh, what we found with them, we found about over a hundred transits from these vessels pre redesign and post redesign. So we could compare um, how the vessels sounded pre and post all these different modifications that were done. And we found that um, the blue line here is the ship noise of the vessels pre-redesign pre and the red is the ship noise of the vessels after the redesign. And we found that in lower frequencies, um, there was a reduction in ship noise, but for the higher frequencies, it didn't, um, it didn't change that much. And we think that's because the, um, the modifications allowed for reduced propeller cavitation because of what they did with the uh, the modifications that they made with the propellers and the bow. Um, but yeah, this was a really interesting study um, to look into design. And there's so many more there's so many more designs that are coming out. There's different fuel types. There's um, electric engines. There's even some sails that they've put onto some of these big ships probably not to get back fully to sail power, but kind of like having the Prius of the container ship, a hybrid system where the sails can help, um, but maybe not fully taking away um, the propellers. So many different designs coming out, super interesting um, approach to reducing noise on a more international level. Okay, so going back to our study area, I'll just talk about one more um, current event and possible solution, and that is um, marine spatial planning or routing, which is kind of interesting to talk about now because um, there is a port um, access route study brought about by the U.S. Coast Guard that happens about every 15 to 20 years, where the U.S. Coast Guard will take into account if some shipping lanes need to be moved or if they need to be, um, or if, if shipping lanes need to be added, and um, if so, um, how. And it only happens every 15 to 20 years, so it's important to get it right if we have the opportunity to. So right now in this area, they're proposing Point Magoo Fairway, which is an additional fairway that wraps around the southern side of the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And um, so I kind of wanted to look at um, 
how this would change the soundscape of this area before it went into, before it potentially goes into effect. So I made some simulations. So um, instead of putting ships where they actually are, I put ships um, where they may be in the future to see what the sound would be like um, in this area if that fairway went into place. Um, oh, okay. So I kept the one simulation as it is now. Um, this is 80% on that main shipping lane in the basin and then 20% outside. And then I created a couple different simulations. One, um, the fairway as it's proposed now, one slightly modified, so it's um, bending, it's just going straight instead of bending up and then giving a buffer to the sanctuary. So the fairway moves away from it. Um, the whole fairway moves away from it. And then I went a little bit farther and I said, let's just see what it would look like if we took out that main shipping lane in the basin and move and just had the proposed fairway. And then with those same modifications. And then um, I, I subtracted what the real situation is from all these different simulations and um, found that with the addition of the proposed fairway, there would be a slightly increase in noise. That red is showing an increase, blue is showing a decrease. And then with the buffer, you can kind of um, get it more to a zero, a zero difference rather than an increase in noise in the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, which is that dotted or dashed line here. Um, so you can kind of reduce that noise by moving, getting, giving the sanctuary a buffer. If you take out the um, traffic separation scheme, you can reduce noise a lot in those blue whale and humpback whale biologically important areas, which are the dotted and solid lines here. Um, but you do get higher, much higher um, noise levels on the southern side of the sanctuary. So all to say, there's so many different routing options um, that you could consider. You could even consider um, combination where maybe you have ships slowing down um, on the main traffic ship or on the main shipping lane, and then um, maybe going a couple knots faster on the outer shipping lane, or um, or a different, instead of an 80%, 20% split, maybe 50-50. Um, so many different things to um, simulate and ponder for future marine spatial planning solutions. So that I think concludes my talk. Um, hope you guys enjoyed those sounds. <laughs> um, I always do. Um, but yeah, so we kind of went over why sound is important in the ocean and how animals use it. Some of the noise of pollution impacts that marine mammals experience and then some solutions as well. So looking into those operational solutions like speed, different designs um, and um, marine spatial planning. And there's so many more um, that, are, that are being explored and many that have already been implemented, which is very exciting. So thank you so much for listening and I'm happy to take a couple questions too, if anyone has. Um, yeah, that was that was awesome. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Um, so I, I've kind of been been fielding some questions both in the chat and uh, offline. I got a few over over text and everything. Um, so I'm happy to kind of to kind of uh, lead the charge here. If uh, I'll, I'll try to sort it so that we're not going too far uh, too far all over the place. Um, but I guess first, kind of on the on the actual recording. So uh, how far away can the instruments pick up the sounds like, you know, both at all and like at the quality that we were hearing, which I assume are like, you know, some of the best samples that you have? Yeah, that's true. That's a really good question. And it kind of depends on um, what frequency um, the sound is. So low, low frequencies travel much farther in the ocean than high frequencies. So some of those low frequencies can travel 150, 100 kilometers, maybe in, in, in deep water too, they travel much farther than shallow water. It kind of attenuates pretty fast in shallow water. So some of our sensors are um, a thousand meters deep. 
So those can pick up a lot of sounds hundreds of kilometers away. The higher frequency sounds like the clicks don't travel as far, maybe tens, five to tens of kilometers. And then, um, so it, yeah, it kind of depends on the sounds, but those are definitely, and then how close the animal is too, of course. But those are kind of some um, numbers for you. Makes sense. Um, and then how many of the sounds that you played are like, which species would a human not be able to hear with their, like without some sort of enhanced audio device? Yeah, so in our hearing range, um, Definitely. Well, I mean, it, it depends how loud you play it too. If you have a subwoofer, you could probably, you could hear a blue whale played at normal speed. Um, but <laughs> from a laptop, you kind of have to speed it up a little bit. So, um, and then there's some ultrasonic sounds that we actually have to slow down to hear. Um, like some porpoises create such high frequency sounds that we, that's not in our hearing range. Um, I don't know. Um, but yeah, like some porpoises create ultrasonic sounds and then the baleen whale, like the blue whale and fin whale are some of the lowest frequencies. Makes sense. Um, and then I, I guess similarly, how do you kind of sort out the biologic sounds versus from like rain or ice? And I hate to ask it because I'm sure everyone in their day jobs in the Bay Area is tired of hearing of it, but is there any way that you like incorporate some AI or anything to, oh, for to sure. um, sort through that stuff? Yeah, for sure. Um, and we have, we need to, because we have just in Southern California, um, accumulated 75 years of data and across the whole world, hundreds of years of data. And I can't be sitting here with my AirPods listening to all of that, you know, well, I would love to, but we have to get through it. And that's, we've trained neural nets to be able to automatically, um, automatically identify these species um, to species level, some of these sounds to species level. And there's one animal um, that, and it, it, there was a lot of work before machine learning. Um, someone had to be out there with the dunk hydrophone, seeing the animal, putting the hydrophone in, seeing the animal make the sound. Um, but now that we have those records and have kind of characterized what species make what sounds, um, we have catalogs and databases of all the different parameters and characteristics that these species make so that we've trained the neural nets on that. And now they can pick out and um, ID the sounds in the in our deployments. So it's super helpful, but um, they it it's definitely a work in progress and it, um, we haven't really gotten away. I mean, I don't think that we should get away from humans looking at the data because context is super important. Like if you, we have some instances where they're like, it's a beluga in San Diego. Well, there was that one beluga in San Diego a couple of years ago, but usually it's not. Um, so context is super important and there's no, um, there's no way that um, I don't think, I think that having a supervised workflow is also super good where humans can also look at the data. Makes sense. Um, and then I guess on, on more of the, the hearing from the animal's perspective, what, what's the, what's the current understanding on, you know, whether whales hear the, you know, like, like what they, how they hear the sounds of kind of the, 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 um, you know, industrialization in the ships yeah. and, do they, is there any evidence of them avoiding ship strikes? Do they just not know what it is? They don't avoid it? Or, or what, what's the current understanding there? Good question. So a couple different questions in there. So how do we know how, what whales hear? Um, so for some of the smaller animals, um, like dolphins, um, they can actually, they've tested their hearing kind of just like how we test ours in a doctor's office. Um, there's a they can, the dolphins have been trained to give the humans um, a nod or a whistle or something when the human plays a certain sound. So they've kind of been able to get the audiogram, they say, of what frequencies these animals can hear. So many dolphins, sea lions, seals, they've been, they have audiograms, but for the larger animals, um, those are mostly based on models, mostly the CT scans. 
and then modeling like pinging sound off of different areas of the skull are their inner ear bones vibrating and that's how we're, we can kind of um, get a guess about what baleen whales can hear and then also people guess if an animal is producing a sound at a certain frequency they are potentially able to perceive sound at that frequency so that's another way to um, get a guess at that but in terms of how are animals experiencing industrial noise it depends on the animal it depends on the species it just depends on what a species is doing context is also super important whether they're feeding or mating or transiting um there have and then i i guess i'm i mostly think about the big whales the baleen whales so there have been instances where um in the santa barbara channel though there will be a a group of humpback whales feeding and in the middle of the shipping lane and they are not moving um, because, you know, they're not really evolved to learn how to get out of the way of huge, fast moving um, structures. So um, some in some instances, they have not seen animals respond. And then with some like high resolution tag data, they've seen a blue whale like slightly dodge uh, or slightly get out of the way of a um, ship. I did, you can also like track an animal acoustically. And then we have seen, a, I saw a fin whale like sprint to get out of the way of a container ship. So it just depends really, it's so hard to study, but for those animals, yeah, I, those are some situations I've seen. Makes sense. And just to be clear, when we're talking about like ship speeds and, and stuff, are, are we just mm -hmm. assuming that lower speed equals lower noise equals the travel, the sound doesn't travel as far, so less disturbance? Is, is that kind of the thought process there? Yeah, you can kind of think about it like that, because if the sound is lower, so I didn't go into the methods about this in super depth, but so when I meant, when I say ship noise in that situation, in those studies, it meant source level, which is a snapshot of the ship noise modeled one meter away from the source. But if you propagate that out, um, higher higher source levels will reach farther differences or the acoustic footprint, as some people say, will be larger than if it is um, a quieter sound. Got it. Well, thank you. I know, I know a few more. I know I'm, I'm peppering you with questions over here. Um, but the so there were a few different different questions kind of surrounding navy and military activities and kind of the disturbances um, caused by those. Can you kind of yeah. address that and you know where you see it as a as a threat versus the broader industrial and commercial space? Hmm, yeah. So there's a couple different navy. So I mostly study commercial shipping, um, but there's some different naval operations like mid-frequency active sonar, which has been, which many people study, um, many marine mammal researchers study um, to see if there's impacts on marine animals and if they avoid these areas. And I'll just speak to studies in our lab. Um, we've seen that beaked whales do leave areas um, where there's mid-frequency active sonar being produced. Um, and there's also, of course, Navy testing explosions and stuff. So a lot of different noise produced, um, but the mid-frequency active sonar is um, one that a lot of people study. And then they've seen that the beaked whales actually don't return to the area for a couple weeks after, even if the mid-frequency sonar stopped. So that's even if it's a really high quality foraging area. So that is not um, ideal for these animals that um, need to dive deep and get their squid and be in that um, foraging habitat. Makes sense. Um, and then I guess going to going to your work, there are a few questions on uh, on just kind of your publications and, and your modeling and everything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing is, I mean, it, I was just doing a quick Google. It seems like you published your paper on retrofitting like a year and a half ago, which is Obviously, not a very long time in the in the grand scheme of the of the supply chain. Um, but since yeah. since that published date, have you have you seen any progress in in retrofitting? Um, as I far don't as know adoption, if it was because that paper, but it, there we'll have been many more. <laughs> sure, yeah, there there have been so many other vessels at 
um, at a lot of different shipping companies. Um, I have most of my contacts are at Maersk. So um, there was even bigger ships than those G-class vessels that have been retrofitted that we're planning on seeing how, if that changed the radiated noise. And those retrofits were for fuel efficiency, um, not to save or not to reduce noise. But now that underwater radiated noise is on the agenda of the International Maritime Organization, organization shipping companies can be a little bit more strategic in saying, oh, okay, this modification changed or reduced underwater radio noise. Let's slap that on the next retrofit if we can, now that we know. So um, I think there's a lot of different design projects going on and it's a, it's a super active part of research just because we're not quite sure what designs um, make, make for the best on re reduction in noise right now, but it's, it's underway. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> awesome. Um, and then is, is there a, is there a library of, of cetaceans and, and noise, uh, of, yeah. I'm sorry, of a cetacean and pinniped noise that, that like the, um, that the public could dial into or, or listen to? Yes. Um, voices in the sea, if you Google that, and then doses, I just put them both in the chat. Um, both are, and they even have like fun um, guessing games, trivia, which is fun um, for anyone. So you can look into those. Awesome. Um, great. And then there was one question on your funding. What's, uh, where, where is, uh, where does kind of your, your funding come from for, oh, for the research that you're doing? Sure. Um, well, my PhD, which is the work that I showed mostly today, that was funded by, I, the Dr. Nancy Foster Scholarship, which was from the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. So I worked with, I got to work with the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary throughout those years. Um, we're also funded a lot by NOAA in the Southwest or the, in the Gulf of Mexico projects, the Southeast Fisheries Science Center. Um, and yeah, we work a lot with the um, NOAA um, National Marine Sanctuaries um, and then California Marine Sanctuaries, National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. Um, so, um, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, one, one more, and just going back to when I, I missed on, uh, on, on yeah. more of like the, the biology standpoint, um, mm -hmm. is there, like, like have, have, has there been any um, evidence of like alert sounds for like, w within whales? Like if there's, you know, have there been a correlation of like, you know, ship nearby, higher pitch of of the whale frequency or is it, um, has that not been detected yet? Um, the question was, do they change their calls based on if a ship is nearby? Yes. Okay, like, so yeah. that is a really good question. Um, people have seen lumbar effects, which means that they are increasing the amplitude of their calls when ships are in the region. So they're in a way, well, to anthropomorphize it, <laughs> or however you say that, they're screaming over the noise. So um, they have to produce louder sounds, which is more energy, um, which might make them use some of their energy for, for calling rather than um, feeding or something like that. So that is one way that they've seen them change their calls. Amazing. Well, I will. I'll. I'll pause there. I know. Uh, you know, we've we've been we've been grilling you for for quite a while. But thank you so much for all of your thoughtful awesome. answers and for such a great presentation. I'll pass it back over Whoa. to Susan. Yeah, I think um, I know what many of us will be listening to tonight when we go to sleep. <laughs> I recommend it those two websites so um yeah and they, they look like one is is it ucsd is the other one ucsd too doses um, the other one is a is not ucsd it's just a, okay. a big coalition of people yeah good to know yeah awesome. anyway it was really fun and awesome. um Vanessa, it sounds like we're gonna have to have you back because i know you're oh, sure. developing <laughs> I think we can all be really happy you're doing the work you're doing. So thank you so very well, thank much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> okay, everyone. Um, Bye. Good holiday weekend and see you all in September. Bye. Bye.